So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Democratic Governor Tony Evers has been governor for a little more than 100 days, which is a traditional benchmark, fair or unfair, a way to judge the progress of new elected officials. So I've asked three academics to think about Governor Evers' first 100 days. To my left is Barry Burton, a political science professor at UW-Madison. Ryan Owens is also a UW-Madison professor and director of the Tommy G. Thompson Center on Public Leadership. And Dennis Driesang is a professor emeritus, UW-Madison La Follette School of Public Affairs, writing a book out on Democratic Governor Pat Lucy out when, Dennis? About a year from now. About a year from now. Right. Well, thanks very much for joining us, all of you. First question, what has Governor Evers done well in the first 100 days and maybe not so well? Dennis. Well, governors have an opportunity uh, that is unique in state government because of their central role in establishing the agenda a policy agenda, an agenda for operating state government for the next four years. Uh, Tony Evers, I think, uh, can be credited with setting out an agenda. Uh, he has a long list of things that he uh, promised that he would focus on during his campaign. Uh, the list is, frankly, too long. Uh, but uh, in these first hundred days, he's kind of narrowed that down and provided a, a bit of a focus for where he would like to see us go. He's incorporated it into his budget proposal, which is a key uh, way of, uh, of setting forth the agenda. So, so I, do you I think, think that's good? A follow up, maybe what he should have done better is not ask so much and not have such a broad uh, 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 agenda? Well, I think that when you're campaigning, there's a temptation to have a long list, depending on the various uh, um, groups that you have to appeal to. Uh, so one can be excused for that. But uh, yeah, if that list uh, continues to be that long, uh, it's going to be bouncing from one to another rather than focusing on what he can get done. Thank you. Ryan? Yeah, I think in terms of the good things he's done, I know a lot of Republicans have been relatively pleased with some of his cabinet selections. Uh, I think uh, Peter Barca, somebody they point to as being a particularly good one. Craig Thompson as well. I know there's some pushback there, but I think yeah. a lot of Republicans think that Thompson will be a good selection. So I think he has surrounded himself with some good people in the cabinet. In terms of things that he hasn't done so well, though, I actually I, I think he hasn't done a particularly good job of setting the agenda. Um, I mean, he's been more reactive than anything this first hundred days. I mean, we hear a lot about the, the lawsuits. Uh, we hear a lot about the what's going on with Foxconn. And there's so much noise that surrounds everything that's going on that he's not able to punch through that with any particular idea that he wants to push forward. I think that's something that he needs to work on quite a bit as he moves forward. Thank you. Barry, your thoughts? I, I have a similar take. I think he's been a bit of a victim of the lame duck session and all the lawsuits and controversy from that. And then the daily drip of news about Foxconn, which seems to never end and, and be somewhat a sort of different message coming from him than from Republican leaders in the legislature. And to have that news plus a complicated agenda with a lot of proposals, sort of a laundry list of things that a Democrat would like to do after eight years of Republican rule, it's going to make it difficult for him, I think, as, as an administration going forward to focus on some key priorities. Can we come back to Foxconn? Because it's in the news almost hourly, certainly daily. Um, do you think he, um, will it hurt him if Foxconn only builds modestly in Mount Pleasant and doesn't build, doesn't invest the 10 billion, doesn't hire the 13,000? Or is he able to say, look, uh, I was not a part of this deal. This was a Governor Walker, Scott Fitzgerald, Robin Voss. So how do you see potentially Foxconn playing out? Although I concede, we don't know what they're finally going to build. Anybody? Well, I think that the, the whole way in which the Foxconn issue has come up, especially in, in recent uh, days, is an acknowledgement that uh, there were a lot of questions initially about whether this was a good deal for Wisconsin. Uh, Tony Evers was part of that skepticism, and I think that provides a bit of distance from Tony Evers and what happens in Foxconn to address your question. Uh, I don't think he gets blamed for it, um, and his idea of sitting down with them and uh, and renegotiating is is a way where he can distance himself 
from the skepticism that accompanied the Scott Walker negotiation. So do well, you agree that he potentially escapes any political no, I downside? No, I, I Respectfully, I, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, he's the governor now, and a lot of this rests on him. I think a lot of people know that this was not his original deal, but he is now the governor, and if, uh, if the company pulls out and it doesn't fulfill some of the promises, uh, I think he'll be left holding the bag with it. Now, I think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing them right now try to redirect the story a little bit or try to control the story. That you know, This is something that Foxconn told us. If, th if, if they can put this on Foxconn and say that Foxconn is the one that's backing out, then I think Evers has some uh, legs to stand on. But otherwise, I think he's going to have trouble with, with people on this issue. Barry, you want to weigh in on the phone? Yeah, I, th I think if the promise of the deal flounders and it looks like it's not Evers that caused that to happen, but it's Foxconn reneging on some promises or not fulfilling what w it's maybe its potential was, I don't think he pays a price. But if it looks like Evers got in the way of Foxconn being successful, then he pays a price. Any governor wants the economy to be doing well. They love jobs. 2.9% unemployment? Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, and you like cutting ribbons and announcing things. Uh, but the deal was negotiated under a previous governor. So I think Evers has this difficult place to be in, to want to facilitate economic growth, and Foxconn is part of that, but also not feel as though he's liable for what happens if things go wrong. I think we also have to uh, factor in the role of the Republican legislative leaders, because they certainly are not uh, silent on this issue. They want to, they're uh, uh, being aggressive and establishing a leadership kind of position. Right now, it's not exactly clear because You've got Voss on the one hand say, well, yeah, I, I think I, you know, uh, remember having a discussion with Foxconn and Fitzgerald is saying, well, I had a discussion, but we didn't talk about renegotiating. Uh, they are inserting themselves here, and I think they've got to be careful about the, you know, the, the whole issue of the scenario of who takes the blame if the Foxconn thing falls out. And what intrigues me, Dennis, to follow up is Mount Pleasant is in the Speaker Voss's district, right. the 63rd Assembly District. So does he, is, does he, does Speaker Voss, have a lot of potential downside politically if Foxconn investment is very modest, much below the 10 billion, 13,000 jobs? I think that Speaker Voss is in a very... Uh, very good position for maintaining his leadership position. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a, uh, the, his base of support is, a, to be very candid, a gerrymandered le uh, the state assembly yes. uh, that is uh, probably protecting him from any kind of questions that his constituents might have. But you can get even money in the Capitol, whether Speaker Voss is taking out a potential run for governor. Right. If the Foxconn investment is modest in the state, isn't that a downside for a potential candidate, Voss? Could be. It you know, depends on how that plays out. Which gets me into Speaker Voss. Do you see him as potentially laying the groundwork to run in, in, in four years? Barry? Well, I don't know. If time is moving so fast in politics nowadays. I don't think I have a good sense of who the Republican candidates might be in four years. Uh, I think Scott Walker's future is still unclear. Uh, Ron Johnson the other day opened the door to potentially running fuzzed for over the possibility of, of him being in for a third term. Uh, there are other prominent Republicans who have certainly given Senate races a shot who are interested in statewide office. Voss, I think his, his name has been on the list for a long time as a potential gubernatorial candidate. So it could be a big field. We'll just have to see how the, the Evers administration, which we're talking about today, plays out over the next three and a half years or so. Recognizing that Speaker Voss is on your board of director, directors. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I, uh, I heard him at a conference uh, a couple of months ago, and he said he has no interest in running for governor whatsoever. Now, right, I mean, politicians always say that. But look, I think whoever runs as a Republican next time for governor has to be an energetic candidate, a candidate that can appeal to uh, the generational constituency as well as the older constituency. Somebody who can get out there in front of big issues that suburban voters and younger voters care about, like energy reform uh, and, and things like that. If Republicans can mount a candidate like that, they can eat into a lot of the areas that have done well, increasingly well for the Democrats, like Dane County uh, and the Milwaukee suburbs. Well, uh, in his State of the State speech and budget messages, the governor, Governor Evers, seemed to extend an olive branch to Speaker Voss and Senate Majority Leader Fitzgerald. But um, they have come back with some pretty harsh comments. So um, uh, uh, do you think they're being unpredictably tough on Governor Evers, or is this just the partisan nature of that wonderful capital that we have? Well, you know, it, it, it depends. Um, it depends on who we're going to get 
from this. Uh, are we going to get candidate Evers or are we going to get a different Governor Evers? He campaigned on being a moderate. His budget was anything but. Um, Republicans have said that they want to work with him. Uh, they have on some things, maybe not on others. I think we're, they're trying to feel each other out right now to see just exactly where they are on some of the issues. But what I would suggest strongly they do is sit down and get together and have regular meetings talk to one another a little bit more often. I think Evers should talk to them. I think Evers should get on the phone and talk to Tommy Thompson. Um, from what I can gather, he, the two of them haven't talked yet. And Tommy stands ready and willing, and I think he could offer up some good advice on, on how to move forward. Well, it seems to me that the lame duck legislation that uh, passed in December, Governor Walker and the Republicans, kind of poisoned the well in terms of, I know Assembly Democratic Leader Hintz is still is so angry about the lame duck legislation. So is that the reason that what looks like there's not a lot of communication right now between Evers and the Republicans? Leaders? I think there are two things. One is that, that certainly tainted the well, and that comes off an election night where Evers won by a very narrow margin. Very narrow margin. Late in the evening when the Milwaukee ballots came in. So I think there was not a, a, a lot of honeymoon to come out of that because of the lame duck and the narrow margin. And then I think Republican legislative leaders are adjusting to life with the governor of the other party. And Evers has said as much in the last few days. This is not unified control by one party where essentially the leaders get together and strategize what we want our message and agenda to be. This is now back to good old Wisconsin politics, which is divided government. We have a lot of experience with that before the Walker era. And uh, you know it's a different role for Voss and Fitzgerald. I agree, conversation and regular meetings would be a great thing. Uh, for the state for making legislation might also be a good strategic thing for Evers to find out where there's space between Fitzgerald and Voss. They are sometimes at odds on some key issues. Especially in transportation, transportation being in the one. Last session, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. So if he can find some room there to sort of play them off against one another, then it becomes a more complicated scenario and I think gives him some room to make some progress. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, back to Foxconn. I think uh, this is a great opportunity for the three of them to get together. Uh, um, there, there seems to be a consensus growing uh, in just in recent hours, if not days, that uh, some renegotiations, some rethinking might be necessary, uh, including, of course, the Foxconn itself. But uh, I think this would be an opportunity for them to do, do some compromising, to do some problem solving and do it together and be seen doing it together, too. The three major campaign issues that Governor Evers ran on his campaign themes K-12 funding, expanding Medicaid, fixing our highways. Did Governor Evers pick the right issues, gentlemen? Well, he won, so I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as but Professor Burden puts out, points out narrowly. Yes. Uh, look, I think transportation is an issue that can get bipartisan support. I think it's a winning issue. Uh, it has yeah. to be crafted appropriately. Uh, you know, we're having a major conference on this at the Thompson Center soon where we're bringing in folks from the Department of Transportation and, and others to try to figure out what, what can work, where, where is a compromise. I think that's an issue they can work on. I also think that criminal justice reform is an issue that Republicans and Democrats can work on. If they pivot to that and make that an issue, I think you'll see some bipartisan support there. Well, let's talk about transportation. The governor recommended eight cent increase in the gas tax, repeal of minimum markup, hiking fees on big trucks. Um, there's some uh, interest in the assembly in some type of a gas tax increase, maybe five cents. Uh, Representative Nigren said we could talk about that. Senator Darling said we're not ready to talk about it yet. Do you see a transportation deal coming uh, potentially, Barry? Maybe. There's a lot of discontent about the transportation system in the state, especially the roads. But I think how to find a solution that works for everyone is harder. So, you know, we can all be unhappy for the same reasons, but finding a common solution is going to be more difficult. I mean, in addition to the list of options you named, tolling is an option that a few people have floated. There, Long -term. there are others, yeah. So I think it's, it's just complicated in terms of getting there. There is an opportunity, um, but it's not going to be easy. Scott Holes, where the billboards, Dennis, that were used. Uh, w was that a pretty effective issue against uh, Governor Walker? Well, that was a, a clever way of, uh, of dramatizing the issue. But I think that there was growing concern about the, the state of our roads. And indeed, anybody who's uh, uh, been on our roads in recent years knows that there's been a degeneration in, in terms of the quality. There's the whole issue of the interstate system and the major highways. So I, I, I agree. I think this is an area where you can get 
uh, compromise where you can get people to do some problem solving. We were talking uh, earlier among ourselves before um, going on the air here about uh, returning to the time when we had uh, a, a formula that helped us with the funding and you didn't have to make this a potentially partisan divisive issue uh, year after year after year and that's something else that might be thrown into the hopper. Well, I want to return to the two other issues that Governor Evers uh, ran on. K-12 funding, he wants $1.5 billion upper over the two years of the biennium, including $600 million more for special ed. Now, the Republicans have said that's a lot, but I think they will, I think they can reach a middle ground. Here's the issue I want to go to. The Republicans have said under no circumstances are we going to approve Medicaid expansion. That is one of Tony Evers' hills on which he's willing to die. So do you see any compromise on that, or is that the potential issue that Governor Evers might veto the entire Republican budget? Medicaid expansion. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but I see no compromise there. Evers and the Democrats are adamant that they want to take the expansion. They, Democrats in the state have wanted to do that since it was offered years ago. Republicans have been adamant that there's no way they're going to accept it. I don't, I don't see any space in between. That's, that's an either or <laughs> option. There's not, a, there's not space to negotiate. Even if you were to build a, a big piece of legislation that had other items in it, I mm -hmm. think that is one that just, it's not a place where either party is willing to compromise. So it, it may be the thing that prevents a budget from being passed this year or at all. Yet the Marquette poll, 70% 70, 70 support that. An increase from 62 in January to 70% in March. I'm not sure they understand. It's such a complex issue. Anybody else on uh, the, the MA expansion? Well, just in terms of the budget, I mean, keep in mind, right, we all know what happens in Wisconsin if the budget doesn't get passed. The status quo retains. So I think in this position, if you're in the legislature, the status quo is your friend. Um, and so that definitely will be sitting out there as they bargain. Do you see no d potential mm -hmm. on MA? Remember, we've got uh, partial veto uh, yeah. authority for the governor. So I think that... Uh, it's conceivable that we still have an impasse over Medicaid expansion, um, but we do have a budget. Um, does budget doesn't have to rise or fall totally on that particular issue. Marijuana, the gover uh, governor offered two things. Let's find a way to legalize medical marijuana. Let's also decriminalize up to possession of up to 25 grams. Did the governor overreach by not just sticking to medical marijuana? Anybody? Probably. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, there's a lot of popular support, but there are a lot of questions about it. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things is we don't really have a lot of evidence. It, um, we don't have good evidence about uh, marijuana and, and its effects, in large part because we got in this kind of dilemma of it's illegal to have marijuana and have drugs generally, so how are you going to do research on it? So uh, um, there are a lot of questions that people have. Um, I don't think they're that that's... Uh, an issue that you, the governor really wants to push real hard on. Medical marijuana is a separate thing. Right. Yeah, I think recreational use is not something Evers is going to, it's not a hill he's going to die on the way he is for Medicaid right. funding. Right. But there's, a, there's mm -hmm. a real middle ground for medical marijuana use where I think there's a lot of support in both parties. And we have neighboring states that are doing that. We have no neighboring states doing recreational marijuana as far as I know. So there isn't a model to emulate, but I think medical marijuana has a lot of, well, a good chance at least in the legislature. The, um, and, and, there, and there's a reason please. for that as well beyond just you know, the, the, the standard reasons for decriminalization. I mean, there's a medical reason, something you could point to that all people can kind of look at and say, you know, this is an objective, compassionate reason for this. You don't have that same thing with the decriminalization issue. The Republicans say the Evers budget spends way too much, wipes out the surplus, which I've looked at the numbers from Fiscal Bureau that does. Do voters care about pro th this, uh, the, how much we spend, the surplus, or is that just inside baseball? Well, I think that that's got to get translated into taxes. That's what, that's what this will boil down to. I think it's too abstract to talk about a deficit or you know, structural deficits, all of these kinds of things. But um, where it really comes down to making some sense for most of us is, what does that mean for my taxes? Well, the Republicans put a, middle, a, t a tax cut on his desk, and he vetoed it. He vetoed it. Now, he w he's offering his own, but he wants to limit the manufacturing and ag. Um, which Republicans say, read our lips, not going to happen. Do so you think this budget that is finally signed, whenever and if it's signed, <laughs> whether it's July, August, September, October, um, will include a middle, middle class tax cut? And are people, as, does that issue resonate? 
The Evers budget will include it because he's promised it. It was a campaign promise and something he's come back to as governor. Yes. It will also include the Medicaid expansion. That's part of the revenue stream that makes his budget work. Without it, the budget definitely does not work. So um, that's, I mean, those are reasons why I think the budget's dead on arrival and we're likely to see nothing. And, and also because Republicans, I think, are advantaged by keeping the Walker budget in place as long as possible. I think he has a political incentive to cut taxes. I mean, one, one of the brushes uh, with which you can paint him at some point, or Republicans will try to, is that he's just another tax and spend liberal. So I think he needs to get out there and, and cut some taxes to help blunt that, at least politically. But two other issues. He's proposing an increase in the minimum wage. He wants to give uh, 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 resident tuition to, uh, the, uh, to un undocumented teens and he wants to give driver's license to undocumented. Um, is this one way that he makes points knowing that, that it's not gonna be signed into law? Is this him scoring with his base knowing that they're not gonna be approved? Yeah, I mean, th th this is one of those issues that I come back to when I, I mentioned earlier, you know, which Tony Evers are we gonna get? You know, the one who promises to be moderate and bipartisan or the one who offers these things up. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was out on a farm not long ago talking to some farmers about different issues, and one of them said something to me about this issue. They said, I'm out here working all the time. I'm trying to get my kids enough money to go to college, and yet we've got a governor out here who's talking about giving in-state tuition to people who are here illegally. And that is not an issue that's going to resonate with rural and some suburban voters. I just think it's, it's a bad issue. It might be good for the base, but I think policy-wise, it's not going to work out well for him. He got elected because of the turnout basically in two counties, Dane and Milwaukee. Do you think uh, he runs the risk of being uh, labeled a governor only interested in our two biggest counties because they, let's face it, elected him? I the downside there? I think all Democrats face that as a possibility because the formula for winning statewide uh, for a Democrat is to get a good turnout in Dane County and in Milwaukee. Um, now, you can't just do that um, but that's that's really pretty essential, and that does make one very vulnerable um, to a charge that you're just interested in the urban areas, you're just interested in in Madison and Milwaukee. So it's not a that's not a Tony Evers thing. That's a Democrat. And this is a complaint you heard from Republican leaders in the legislature mm -hmm. already that his cabinet picks are from Dane and Milwaukee counties. His first four. That from he's Milwaukee. governing from the left and really representing these two parts of the state and ignoring the rest of the state. I think when things bog down in the legislature this spring and summer, I expect to see Evers go on the road and start to do town hall meetings and other events around the state. Uh, Tammy Baldwin and some other Democrats have done a good job, I think, at trying to mm -hmm. make sure their identities are not too wrapped right. up in Madison and Milwaukee. Well, well me, right, right. just uh, the, the flip side of that, too, is I, I completely agree with what you guys both said. But Republicans need to do a better job winning in those areas, too. I mean, we can't forget that. Democrats tend to run up their numbers in Dane and Milwaukee. But Republicans, I think, run the risk when they come out there and they say, oh, it's just Madison, Milwaukee. I and mean, that's almost as if you're saying that those areas don't count. And they need to have candidates who can run in those areas if they stand a chance of winning, uh, certainly in the future generations. Well, just yesterday I asked the governor's staff, how many of these town hall meetings on the budget has he held? And uh, the total was eight with two more coming. So this is him. Uh, when I interviewed the governor in the first 100 days, he said, I'm going out there and I'm going to build support for MA expansion out there in these different regions. Do you see him as a pretty effective retail politician? Because up until his election as governor, he's been pretty low key on the power chain in the capital. So he goes on the road. Mm -hmm. Is he able to score with people? Yeah, I mean, those are his roots. He, he's not a person who grew up in Madison. He, I think he pitched himself as a, but a progressive from Plymouth when he was on the campaign yes. trail and worked in school districts in some smaller communities around the state. So I think he's able to talk to those communities, and there are some issues that would resonate. I think Medicaid expansion is one. Uh, treatment of undocumented residents <laughs> is probably not going to go as far, mm -hmm. uh, though there are farms where undocumented workers are essential to just you know, getting the harvest done. Um, so I think you know he's, he's, if he's smart, he's going to limit the agenda in the way that Dennis suggested. Find two or three things where he feels he has an advantage in public opinion, can work the state, put the Republicans on some defense, and maybe find some common ground. Mm -hmm. What about his style? I mean, here's a governor that in his budget message and state of the state, folks, you know, almost the golly. Um, this is a different style from Governor Walker, who stayed on message very, very well. So. 
he's not the high profile, charismatic soundbite governor. Um, how do you rate him on style? Is this something that are, is going to grow on the voters? Or are they going to see him as, yeah, you started out as a science teacher, thank you very much, but in terms of charisma, not so much? Well, um, when I look back on past governors, including Governor Lucy, who I spent a lot of time. Who I want to come uh, to. Yeah, um, focusing on. He was not very charismatic either. Uh, and uh, the one of the concerns about Democrats when uh, in the primary when Tony Evers was running is that, as you point out, he's not a charismatic speaker. He doesn't have a, a warm style. Uh, he's not a Tommy Thompson. Um, and uh, I think what that means is that, like uh, previous governors who have lacked charisma, it's really going to have to be the message. And he's really going to have to relate to people primarily on substance, not style. Well, I want to read your book whenever it comes out. Good. Now, you <laughs> said Lucy offered some pretty bold changes. Did he get most of them done? Because remind me, did, did he have a Democratic ledge or half and half or what? Uh, he had a Democratic assembly okay. uh, and a Republican uh, Senate. It was a time when it was not as polarized. Uh, in being a Republican and Democrat didn't mean as much then as it does now. Uh, did he get uh, things accomplished? Absolutely. He had uh, a long list, uh, and some of them were dealing with the issues uh, today. Uh, transportation uh, is uh, is an issue. Health care. Didn't uh, he merge the uh, then state colleges? And he did. He, he merged the Madison university system. It was a major kind of issue in Madison. Yes. Yeah, and if the rest of the state said, yeah, go for it. You know, merge it. Um, but it was a, a real hot issue. So he... He was able to really get a lot done, uh, and actually you take a look at the, the accomplishments, they're very similar to what you had in the La Follette McGovern period. Follow up Dennis, did he get those big changes done by the power of his personality or by cutting the deals that he had to get done? He didn't really cut deals, in, uh, interestingly. He didn't do a lot of you know quid pro quo. Uh, um, he was uh, personality, but it was personality in a, uh, behind closed doors. He was personality and persuading people that, you know, the state really needs it. And again, he was dealing, to be fair and have a good perspective on this, in a time when being a Republican and being a Democrat was not that big a deal. Let's, let's, let's make an assumption that by not including Medicaid expansion, the Republican budget that they put on Governor Evers' desk forces him to veto the whole budget. Where do we go from there? Uh, stalemate for weeks, um, how would a potential, and I realize this is so theoretical, I concede that, how would a potential deadlock after he vetoed a whole budget be resolved? Thoughts? Uh, I, I don't know. We haven't been there before. Uh, maybe two ways. One is we wait till the next round of elections and hope it resolves itself there. Both parties will have a message <laughs> they can take to the voters. Mm -hmm and hope that voters put one party in control and, and fix things. That's going to take a few years. Uh, another possibility will be a lawsuit where someone says, look, the Constitution says you need to take some action on the budget. I don't know that that suit would be successful, but that's what we're seeing in Wisconsin of late is when someone's unhappy, they file suit. Yes. So my <laughs> guess is that the courts are going to get involved in some way. Well, when I talked to Governor Evers to, uh, to assess the first 100 days and the, the process of that stalemate, he said, look, I was DPI superintendent our school districts need to know how much state aid they're going to get next year. So that might be a reason for him to seek some potential compromise. Yeah. I, I think, you know, this could be an opportunity to him uh, to come out and look very gubernatorial. I mean, he is, as I said, he's the governor. He's got to look past this. I mean, these things with the lawsuits and Foxconn, he's got to get past that. Uh, w we all need to get past it. But for him in particular, he's the governor. He's the one in charge clear the field, get past this, and start working on your agenda. I think that's an opportunity for him. Okay. Any thoughts, Dennis, on a potential compromise that could resolve a budget stalemate? Well, uh, as Barry pointed out, we haven't been there before in terms of having a long-term budget stalemate. We've had budget stalemates through the fall uh, into October. That's, uh, that's happened several times. And if that happens, con conceivably, that could help uh, um, affect uh, elections. But again, whenever you're talking about elections for the state legislature, you have to factor in the gerrymandered 
situation in terms of whether or not you can really swing enough to go from one party to another. But the gerrymandering, which gives him really the ultimate veto power over the next redistricting plan, whether it's drawn by Republicans or Democrats. So that's really where he's got final say. He's got final say over the Republican budget, but vetoing in the next redistricting reapportionment plan gives him a pretty big stick, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the next plan is going to go to the courts. Yeah. Okay. I think everybody which expects that. That's right. Done, which is, I think. Right. And we've been there before. <laughs> yeah, many that's, times that's before. kind of yeah. SOP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before he was elected governor, as DPI superintendent, Governor Evers was not a high-profile, big-name Wisconsin Democrat. How well do you think he has assimilated or moved as now the leader of the Wisconsin Democratic Party? Is he comfortable with that new role? I don't think he's there yet. And this is sort of back to an earlier point. Ryan asked about the way he campaigned versus the way he's governed. And I think the mismatch between his budget, which is pretty bold, and his style, which is pretty <laughs> mild, those things don't make sense together for a lot of people. And I think it's easy to misread who he is or what he's about if you look at one versus the other. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the electorate still has some learning about him to do. Um, I think a lot of Democrats uh, Democrats are obviously happy he won the governorship and are trying to figure out what model that sets for winning other elections. But there are other Democrats on the scene. Tammy Baldwin, I mentioned before, has won re-election. She won by a bigger margin than he did mm -hmm. and did better outstate beyond uh, Dane and Milwaukee County. So I think the, the Democrats are still searching for what they want to be about. They, they had a lot of success in statewide races in 2018. But I think as a party, don't have quite the clear identity that the Republicans have had. Was it a major win for Democratic Governor Evers to get the National Democratic Convention July 13 through 16 in 2020? Yeah. I is that, that a win for huge. Evers or for other Democrats like Senator Baldwin? Well, for all of them, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, it's going to bring in a lot of money, a lot of attention. These people are going to be on the ground for a very long time, building up networks. Uh, I think, you know, typically we see approximately a 2 or 3 percent, you know, bump uh, in states that have these. So I think uh, the Democratic National Committee moving it here, I think it was a smart choice for them. Okay. As long as it's not 1968 all over again. That's true. Yeah. 1968 there are conventions in and there Chicago. Are conventions. Yep. Right. Yeah. The uh, the win of Justice uh, Supreme Court Justice Elect Brian Hagedorn, is that ominous for Governor Evers as the courts play a greater role in whether our laws stand or are thrown out? Uh, do you see the election of Hagedorn as something Governor Evers should be worried about? I don't think he needs to be worried about it. Um, obviously, it would have been better for him uh, had Neubauer won. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you look back at that election, I don't think many people thought Hagedorn was going to win that. But there are a lot of reasons why he did. And one of them is, uh, look, in 2018, uh, re Republicans were playing defense across the board everywhere. They had to defend Trump. They had to defend Walker. They had to defend everything. This time around, Democrats had to defend some turf as well. They had Tony Evers. They had the Democratic uh, primary process. Um, you know, and, and, and so this time around, Republicans had a foil that they were able to use. And I think those attacks on Hagedorn the religious attacks that they used against him completely backfired. Um, so for for Evers, yeah, it's not great. Um, but look, I mean, uh, I know Brian Hagedorn. Uh, he's going to be a, a good judge, a uh, good justice. He's a fair guy. I think he'll do well. Okay. I, th uh, I think, it, you know, it is a reminder that Evers is on kind of an island as the Democrat <laughs> in the governor's office. He's facing Republicans in both chambers of the state legislature, a Supreme Court that has a larger conservative majority, and more of these issues are being resolved in the court, including some of the lame duck legislation that's still <laughs> being litigated. So uh, you know, it puts him in a difficult position, uh, really operating by himself. Is it a disadvantage that our Governor Evers never served in either the Assembly or the Senate? I mean, neither did Jim Doyle. W w yeah. Did, did Governor Lucy serve in the ledge? He served in the Assembly, he but did. Just, just for one term. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that's a major factor, one way or another, in terms of being an effective governor. Okay. Well, we're, uh, we're almost out of time. When I asked the former science teacher, Governor Evers, to grade his first 100 days, he said it's incomplete. So I'm not going to ask you guys to give him a grade. But <laughs> here, here's what I'm going to ask. What are you going to watch in the next six months in terms of sorting through how effective Governor Evers is going to be? What key criteria are you going to watch? Barry? Uh, a lot about the messaging that comes from the governor's office. Do we get past the focus on Foxconn and the lame duck lawsuits? Even if those are still in the news, he's got to find a way to leave a positive stamp of his own on the news. And so that'll mean, I think, limiting his agenda to two or three items that are consistent with his campaign message and where 
there's some room to either pressure the Republicans or find common ground with them. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the other thing is just the, the relationships that he can build with leaders on the other side. Um, with divided government, you always have to give a little to get a little. And I'll be curious to see who gives and on what they give and what they get. Um, but I want to see that dynamic work out. I'm hopeful that folks can work together and try to get at least something accomplished. Dennis. The budget is always an important arena for how governors and legislatures are going to work uh, together or not. And uh, so I see that that's going to be a really key area to watch to see what happens in terms of negotiations over the budget. I do have one final question. I promise it's the final one. Do you see a Governor Evers in the first 100 days growing more comfortable in the role of governor, Dennis? Uh, boy, I think that one's incomplete. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Ryan? No, I, I come back to the earlier answer. Um, he's still, I think, trying to figure out who he is. I think he's, he's taken a lot of liberal positions to placate the base so that he can uh, uh, assure them, hey, I'm in charge of the party right now. Um, once that settles, I think we'll have a better definition of where he's going to, to, to operate. I think we'll have to revisit it at that point. And Barry? Yeah, I don't know that it's comfort exactly, but it's figuring out, especially what his relationship is with Republican leaders. They, I think they have different ideas of what that's about, how often they should be meeting, what things they should share, what, where, where they should keep themselves separate, and, and that's still to be determined. Wow. Thanks so much. Really mm -hmm. fascinating t subject. Isn't it interesting to watch Governor Evers and the Republican legislators? It is. And maybe I'll have you guys back to ask how it is in six months or so. I want to thank Barry Burden, Ryan Owens, and Dennis Driesang for this look at Governor Evers' first 100 days in office. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you. Thank mm -hmm. you.